Thanks for joining me. My name's John Cosgrove, but I trade as JC. Welcome to my workshop. Now, some of you have been here during the earlier experiments and will no doubt notice we've had some upgrades. Honestly, I can't get over how much more real this all became in the course of two short months. I think you'll agree it was worth the wait though. See, the idea behind this series was to use animation to help make some of the abstract ideas I teach easier to engage with. So I wanted a workshop full of special tools like the orrery here, we'll use him later. And it also seemed fitting because the subject of the first episode is all about a special machine that can't exist in real life, but it's been fundamental to everything in computer science, the Turing machine. Yep, I made one. We'll be back here in a tick. But how come I'm talking about Turing when this is a series about agentic AI? Well, that's exactly why I'm making it. The best way I know how to explain this new tech is to first teach some of the background and fundamentals. See, I don't believe maths and computer science concepts are too hard for the average person, or that most people don't want to engage with it. If that were true, we wouldn't all love Attenborough documentaries so much, or watch Mythbusters, or listen to Sir Stephen Fry. The trick is to tell the story behind the concepts and to ground the more abstract things in practical, accessible ideas. Uh, now, I might suck at doing that in the end, but thanks for watching the video and letting me at least try. Rather than just be another video on chatbots or the ChatGPT secret your lawyer doesn't want you to know, I'm trying to give a crash course on the key computer science concepts that got us here. Because it actually makes AI easier to understand if I do. Not only that, but being constantly at the front line of how we're actually rolling out bigger and bigger agentic AI systems and swarms, I've formed a pretty strong view around how to understand their collective behavior. It's biased to my background in biology, but it works. Instead of constantly arguing about artificial consciousness, a thing we still have absolutely zero accepted scientific definition for, by the way, I think we're missing the real point. Generative AI powered agents are absolutely a form of artificial life. And just like its more popular brother, artificial intelligence, artificial life is an actual formal branch of computer science. It's got so much to teach us about understanding and potentially governing agent-based systems. And I also happen to think it's one of the most beautiful things in the world. So the first three episodes are going to be all about explaining the connection between artificial life and generative AI. And to do that, we will have to learn about a thing called cellular automata. Basically, an autonomous machine that works in cells. And guess what the first one of those was? Yep, this gorgeous thing, the Turing machine, invented by Alan Turing. Before computers were even a thing, this simple hypothetical machine is the original metaphor for computation, and it's surprisingly good at explaining what a large language model actually is. But first, let's define the machine. Imagine an infinite roll of tape. That tape is divided into little squares or cells, each square able to hold a symbol, a one, a zero, or a letter. Now picture a little machine perched on top of the tape. It's made up of an eye that can see the tape and a program inside that tells it what to do. It can also move the tape left or right when its program tells it to in response to what it sees. Finally, it's even able to overwrite the tape itself, changing the value of a cell. With these simple ideas, it's possible to write incredibly complex algorithms, programs that change the tape, interpret the change, and make yet more changes. The reason the Turing machine is hypothetical is because it technically requires an infinite tape to meet Turing's original hypothesis. But if you could make one that was infinite, well, it turns out that this machine could calculate anything that a modern computer can, a concept known as Turing completeness. Wondering how that works? Let's slow the tape down and do a worked example. We're going to set up what's sometimes called a three cell Turing program. The rules are simple. The eye can read three cells at a time. To keep things really simple, cells are only allowed to have two values, black or white. When the eye reads the three cells underneath it, the program inside tells it what action to take. The action will be to potentially change the value of the immediate next cell and then move the tape. At which point the machine reevaluates the cells now under the eye again. So the eye reads three black cells. The program returns an instruction. Set the next cell to white, and then move the tape to the right. The machine dutifully changes the cell to white, and shuffles the tape along. 
the eye scans again. But now the pattern isn't three black cells. It's two black, one white. The program returns the instructions for that input combination and it's the same as last time. Set the cell to white and move right, okay? And like last time, the eye is now seeing a new combination. One black, two white. The instructions come back differently this time. The cell should be black, then move right. Because the cell is black, the machine just moves the cells along. And once again, the eye is now seeing a new pattern. Two white, one black. It performs the instructed actions again. It reads again, yet another new pattern. New instructions, which it follows, new pattern. New instructions and actions, new pattern. New actions, and pause. Huh, wait a minute. We've seen that pattern before. That was how we started, three black cells. If we keep going now, then we can probably guess what's going to start to happen. Because the instruction set wound up returning to the same position and set up, the instructions are going to loop. We're going to see this pattern of three black, two white, one black, one white, become the continuous output on the right side of the machine. But for how long? Well, we can speed this up all we like and it will go on forever because the Turing machine has an infinite tape, remember? Even with a simple set of rules and actions, we could set up a system that would compute that pattern potentially infinitely. But if we changed even one rule or one action, we could see a radically different outcome. We could also see the need for more rules to cover all the combinations of three cells. We could even see the total number of combinations go up even higher if we introduce letters and numbers to each cell instead of just true or false. And imagine what happens if we let the eye see even more cells at once. You can see how it was possible for Turing to assert, and ultimately it was proven, that this little hypothetical machine could solve basically any computable problem. All you need is enough rules in the brain and enough tape. And this is why I use Turing machines to teach the basics of large language models. They have the biggest rule set of any computing machine system we've ever tried to build. In fact, it's so big we have trouble even working out how many rules there really are. And as for the values of the tape, it's not just letters and numbers anymore. It's all the languages, sounds, images, and more of human experience. It's truly mind boggling, which is why I don't want you to worry about any of that right now. Instead, let's do what Turing did and abstract all of that away while we get our head around the basics of the machine. Because we're not here to focus on the rule set in this video, we're here to focus on the tape. A large language model doesn't actually have the same freedom as the Turing machine. It can't have an infinite tape firstly, but more importantly, it's not allowed to move the tape backwards. Just like you might've noticed in our example, the rules are all set to move the tape through in one direction and LLM spits things out. But we've also seen from our example that if you change the pattern going under the eye, you change what actions it takes. Not only that, but in our example, the eye winds up being able to see cells that it just changed. Effectively, in our example, the machine starts changing its behavior because of how it behaved in the past. A machine changing things in the present based on what it did in the past usually involves us talking about memory. And that's exactly what the tape in a Turing machine represents. It literally represents the computer concept of memory. It's the storage system. It's the record. There's no memory in the eye or in the rules. They don't remember what they did one cell ago. All that matters now is that they interpret what's in front of them, even if it was the machine itself that did it. A process of doing something next based on interpreting what you've done in the immediate past is called regression or regressive in statistics and computer science, like drawing a line of best fit through some dot points to predict where the next dots might be. So the big clue about what's gonna happen next is when I tell you that the formal name for what we call an LLM is actually the autoregressive transformer. Auto, in this case, means self, a self-regressive transformer. Something that transforms the next step based on analyzing its own immediate past. An LLM knows what word it should next print onto the tape because it sees all the words it wrote beforehand and it has a rule set so vast, it can find exactly what instruction it should do next. And how does it see all the words it wrote beforehand? Easy. We break Turing's original design and we loop the tape. Now the cells we wrote out earlier can whisk their way back across to the input point of the machine. At the same time though, 
we're still going to allow those big tape hoops to be potentially infinite. Basically, we're going to let the machine write as much as it wants to or stop when it wants to. There's still no limit to the tape, but after each new cell update, we're going to take everything written on the tape and feed it back through again. Thus, as the machine keeps picking the next word, it shapes also the words to come. Eventually though, the machine will reach a resting pattern, like our three black cells in our worked example. For an LLM, there is a special token called N. When the machine instructions decide it's time for the N token, we stop writing any more on the tape. We can loop it back all we want. The machine will still decide that this is the place to stop. And if the LLM has been well trained, it will stop because that's the end of the paragraph or the page or poem. So a quick recap. We can imagine that an LLM works like a Turing machine. Only the tape can be any of our letters and words as a value and the rule set is mind bendingly massive. So it can basically read what it's already written and use those rules to pick the best word to write next until it's actually the best time to write no more words at all. We just loop the Turing tape back into the machine and voila, it's auto-regressive. It can punch out a complex sequence based on the sequence it's written so far. Wait a minute. If that was all there was to it, wouldn't that mean that every LLM would just wind up repeating the same pattern and shutting down? Exactly like the repeating pattern in our example? And of course the answer is yes, which is why we don't use LLMs by just letting them run themselves. We force them to interact with novel and complex starting patterns on the tape other words and symbols from outside the LLM from another machine that is also sharing the same loop of tape. Yep, you guessed it, the other machine is us, the user. Every time you're using a generative chatbot, what's happening is the machine has stopped and we're waiting to collect your input on the tape. When you hit enter, the cycle starts again. Only now, the base state of the tape has been changed by what you typed. You take your initial sequence, hi, how are you, and feed it in. Instead of a blank tape, this is now what the eye sees as the initial pattern. Based on the gigantic rule set inside the LLM, the machine outputs, hello. Once again, the machine has selected the end token and the system has come to rest. Now you respond, what do you think of flat caps? What the machine now gets from the loop is actually a tape that looks something like this. Hi, how are you? Hello? What do you think of flat caps? We actually feed the whole conversation, both sides taking turns, back into the machine. Thus, the machine knows it's in a conversation and the rules engine proceeds to spit out a specific sequence. Each time the machine starts because tape enters, the eye and the rules generates the response sequence, looping again and again until all the tokens are output and the end token is selected. The human then adds their response to the end of the sequence and the whole thing gets fed back in again to repeat. See, it's true, all the cool cats do wear flat caps. Here's the critical lesson in all of this. The machine still doesn't know what it just did. It only reacts to the full tape it's given, which grows and grows in length of tokens and therefore amount of processing with each and every new iteration. But the LLM doesn't have memory. It isn't remembering anything at all. In fact, all the LLMs you're using are stateless, which means any computing system which is incapable of storing or saving its state between actions. What we see as a conversation is actually this loop repeated at very high speed. There's no memory, there's no self. There's just a loop, a tape, and a very clever machine executing a model that someone trained in advance. Before the machine learning street gangs lynch me on LinkedIn, let me just say this. I know the analogy isn't perfect, and it's not meant to be, but it is more valid than a lot of people might realize at first glance. See, there's something very special about the eye of the LLM compared to a traditional Turing machine. It's easy to see how this works when the eye can see one, five, or even 10 segments of tape at once. But what if it could see thousands? What if it could see millions? If it could somehow pay attention to millions of tokens of context all at the same time? What sort of rules could be possible that's a knowing wink to something called the attention mechanism that we're going to go into more detail in a later video, but it's enough for now. For now, our goal 
is to understand the architecture around the actual large language model itself, because that's the part most of us get to control when designing systems. Once you treat the prompt like a looped tape, you start to see how everything from chatbots to agents to really entire orchestration frameworks is really all about managing the tape in the Turing machine. And that introduces our third actor. Who's the one doing that managing? As the developer, you technically moderate the steps between the large language model and the user. And that means you can edit the tape. You can show the LLM more than you show the user, like structured data API returns or intermediate results. You can hide things from the LLM, like PII that's visible to users but are irrelevant to the model. You control the loop, what's appended, trimmed, masked, chunked, or restructured before the next run. Every architecture decision changes the outcome, even when the model stays the same. That's why I start every lesson on working with generative AI with this little explanation of the Turing machine. Because the special trick of the machine isn't the eye or even the rules, it's the tape. It's all about the tape. And that is 100% absolutely the same case with literally all architectures you will build with LLMs. We call the tape in generative AI the context. And we call the amount of it, which the eye can see at once, the context window. This relationship between the eye and the tape, the context and the window the context can fit in, is literally all you need to master in order to become very proficient indeed at using large language models. But it's absolutely essential if you're going to understand agents and multi-agent architectures because we're not all going to be training our own models unless you have a couple of spare million bucks lying around. But we can all become context engineers, managers and orchestrators of the thread of memory that ultimately steers all the behavior of the system. Because, well, that's basically just a big old tape full of text. Congratulations. You've just learned all about the foundation of modern computer science, the Turing machine. You've learned about Turing completeness and even dipped your toe in complexity theory and system dynamics. You've learned how to think about key gen AI hashtags like context, window, and state in more mechanical and hopefully intuitive terms. And most importantly, nothing we've covered here is wrong or so metaphorical that it loses application or meaning. As we'll cover in the coming episodes, viewing large language models as a form of cellular automata is actually the view of some of the greatest computer scientists in the world. So it's not some fringe idea that JC is really into. It's actually the correct way to understand what's going on. At the end of the day, this is a machine made of maths. If we're truly going to harness and design with it, then we need to functionally understand it. And that that shouldn't require us to take things on faith or throw our hands up in the air and say, oh well, it's non-deterministic. And you really, really shouldn't have to write prompts that plead, threaten, or just talk in all caps. Well, not unless you have very specific objectives for your chatbot in mind, but that's definitely a you issue. In our next episode, we're going to introduce you to JC's favorite organism for learning about emergent behavior and complex systems, the termite. Well, in fact, what I'm going to introduce you to is called a termite. No, really, that's a joke I didn't even make up myself. Don't see the joke. Join us for the next episode. It'll make more sense written down. Cheers.